This archival video was filmed at the Shankman Art Center in Orléans, Ontario. On the bottom right-hand corner of your screen is an ASL interpreter. Please note that due to the nature of the topics presented, all personal descriptions were provided by the participants. Cyrus is a five-foot black trans-disabled man with long blue dreadlocks and a round belly. Sarah is a five-foot-four, fifty-year-old white female with brown hair above the shoulder length and chunky black-rimmed glasses. Welcome to <laughs> Welcome to the Republic of Inclusion. This is Cyrus speaking, and this is Sarah speaking. We want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people, and we recognize that this is uh, Indigenous land and we are thankful for the chance to gather in this place. Looks at his tablet. Um, this is Cyrus still speaking. We just wanted to go over, so welcome to this republic. We wanted to go over some of the agreements that we share while together in this space. Um, we are a beautiful, interdependent, and borderless republic that centers a coming together and co-creation of space wherein we all have everything that we need to survive and thrive. Here, we find ourselves living outside of the constraints of an ableist, autist, sanist, and ocular-centric world. Here, we are co-creating an environment that supports indigenous resurgence, the movement for black lives, and status for all. Here, we support gender diversity and freedom of expression, and we celebrate lesbian, gay, bi, transsexual, transgender, intersexed, two-spirited, queer, questioning, and asexual identities, and all forms of sexual diversity. Here, we are immersed in a community that recognizes multiple experiences of difference and their intersections with disability, deaf, and mad cultures. So while you're with us here in this republic, we will share the following commitments. We are all here. We support and maintain the self-determination of everyone here. This means that we get to decide our lives for ourselves. We celebrate the beautiful diversity of experiences, communities, and cultures within this room. We respect each other's gender pronouns. We each get to choose our own words and names to describe ourselves. We build community together through shared discussion, collective experiences with artworks and artists, and through carrying these conversations forward in our home communities. We celebrate and embrace the concept that things start when they need to start. We embrace and celebrate taking our time and continuing to try to find new ways to our own ways of creating, working, and sharing space and time together. We are all free to come and go and to take breaks and rest as often and as much as we need to. We take care of ourselves and we extend care to others with consent. So those are the agreements of the Republic of Inclusion. A little bit about the space that we're in. We're in a large black box. There are um, white and <clears throat> yellow uh, tape guides on the floor. They have a bit of texture to them if you're moving through the space and need to use those as guides. There are projections on three screens, one behind me and one to my left and one to my right. Um, the two screens on the either side of me are projecting the ASL interpreter right now, and the one behind me is projecting the community agreements. There are some fun things, uh, tactile things to engage with on the floor here in the front, and also on a table at the back by the door, if you want to play with those or use those as a way of being engaged. Christina Watt is our active listener again today, and Christina is standing uh, by the front entrance of this space wearing a, a white blazer and waving her hands right now. She is an active listener, and you can uh, find her there. That is my current thought. Thanks. This is Sarah speaking. Um, I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Baraka de Soleil, who's uh, outside right now working with us to uh, rearrange the, um, the table situation for our lunch and our dinner to make it a more inviting space for all. Um, part of our, our learning as we're working through this. So um, please, if you see him, thank him for uh, the improved um, layout uh, uh, when we go out for lunch. Um, as was read out in the, uh, in the agreement, please do feel free to come and go. Uh, we have uh, a program on paper um, in front of you, um, and uh, just to say that uh, on it are some performance bursts, 
and two, this is for this morning, two 45 minute discussions. So that's, uh, there's sort of three performances and two 45 minute discussions, and then we'll break for lunch before we come back in um, for the afternoon. Um, I want to um, acknowledge Cyrus, um, um, who's been an, uh, just an incredible collaborator um, as we uh, move into this day, and to Jesse Stong, who's um, done incredible uh, work in terms of bringing so much of the information into a place where we can witness it and get to know the um, incredible, extensive amount of work that has already been created, um, work that uh, we hope you'll tell us about that we for sure have missed. Um, and before uh, I pass it back to, to Cyrus, just to say that at some point on the screens um, in the next few minutes will be projected um, uh, what we're calling the compendium, and um, and we hope that um, that you, as I say, will see uh, works that you recall, remember artists that you recall, remember. Uh, shout out to those uh, who are with us here, and um, and that you'll let us know um, how we can add to this um, as uh, as we're working over time. That is my current thought. Um, there is audio description, so if you needed audio description, CAD is providing audio description, and thank you as well to the ASL interpreters. And now... Uh, Leans over to Sarah. There, oh yes, we are also live streaming, and um, we would like to say uh, hello to everyone who's participating from home, maybe from bed. Sarah Waves. They are part of our uh, gathering here today. So hello to everybody on the live stream. From time to time, you'll see what's being projected on the live screen on the sides, uh, side screens. Um, so hello to everyone who is on the live stream. And now we will take it over to Lau. Thank you. Rose, in a simple white dress, takes the mic in the performance area. They identify as a 5'8", genderqueer artist of color in their 40s with dark brown skin and short black hair, close cut at the sides. How's everyone? Good? So we've been invited uh, to help design the space with Cyrus and Sarah. As well, we're musicians, we have a space in Toronto um, where we, it's an accessible space, it's a DIY space. It's also accessible in terms of economic and physical accessibility as much as we can. And so we've been invited because the work that we do is about sharing and connecting with all kinds of communities and understanding that we are part of a, of a web of energy and people. So um, we are so grateful to be here and participate. And um, please dance or move, or whatever it is that you wish to do while we do this, yeah? Nick stands behind a console of electric musical equipment. He is six feet tall in his early 40s. He's a slender black male of Caribbean descent with a shaved head. He wears glasses. That incredible, that incredible, that incredible feeling, 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 cloudy and blue, cloudy and blue, cloudy and blue, reckoning, reckoning. In the performance area, on the giant projection screen behind the musicians, bright drawings, illustrated live, begin to build. All oh, the street lights, all oh, the street lights and the sunlight has risen, has risen, has, has, has risen. And then back to beginning and then back to beginning be 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 beginning be be beginning be be beginning and then and then back to beginning and in the theater there is a performance area and a conversation circle the conversation circle is an area defined by several solid and dotted tape lines on the floor in the circle, there are four chairs pointed towards the center. At center is a close-up camera. Eventually, participants will sit in the chairs or a chair will be replaced by a scooter or a wheelchair.
A spectator stands and dabs their arms to the music. Another crawls on all fours. A third wheels his electric wheelchair front and center. The drawings continue to grow on the projection screen as the artist shifts the image to work on another section. Yes, join us. <laughs> Rules were meant to be broken. Rules were meant to be broken. Rules were meant to be broken. Drifting wheel, drifting wheel, drifting wheel, drifting. Drifting in a tail untold. Drifting in a tail untold. Hope is planted in people gravitate to the performance area. Hope is planted in this room of soul till the night sky. Participants dance, sway, crawl, and bounce. Some have person sized inflatable cylinders. The night sky woken is broken. Rules are meant to be broken. Rules are meant to be. The names of compendium playwrights scroll at various angles and in mirror images on the projection screen. They are intersected with words from the Republic's agreement. Rules were meant to be broken. 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 There's sub packs. There's base sub packs in the back. So take it, take a seat and feel it. The interpreter at right bounces to the music while she signs. Others dance energetically around her. Today we are arriving, tomorrow we will leave. Today we are arriving, tomorrow we will leave. Today we are arriving, tomorrow we will leave. Rules were meant to be broken. Rules were meant to be broken. Rose puts down the mic. In the conversation circle, Justin, Cyrus, Rachel, and Leah are seated. Justin identifies as a two-spirited, indigenous man. His left hand is absent of most fingers, and he describes it as his animal spirit hand. Rachel describes herself, quote, Rachel is mixed race of European and African descent. She looks quite pale and was in this video, as she is more sick than usual at the moment. She is slouching in her chair and does not move much while she is speaking, but her face looks animated at times. End quote. The dancing audience members slow down and return to the seating areas. Cyrus stands and goes to the mic at right. He wiggles his hand to get someone's attention and points at the mic. He removes the mic from the stand and carries it to his seat. Lights come up on the conversation circle close up on each person as they speak. Behind them, some dancers high ten. Cyrus speaks. So this first uh, conversation burst is thinking about intersections in theatre. And we've been talking a lot over the last eight days, over the last 500 years. Close up on Cyrus. The ways that um, our experience of our lives 
impacts our experience of madness, of disability, of deaf culture, and vice versa. Um, you know, so I just wondered, just as a sort of an opening question, what you think of when you think about intersectionality and theater. Spectators sit around the perimeter of the conversation circle. Cyrus, with a big smile, offers the mic back and forth to the others within the circle. <laughs> Can we dance again? <laughs> <laughs> it's Rachel speaking, and my shoes are off because I was going to dance. Um, so when I think about intersectionality in theater, um, I think about the struggles of our social movements to break into spaces of cultural reproduction, to be able to take space to communicate. Um, and that raises a bunch of questions. So one is um, how are our social movements, um, what kind of struggles happen inside our movements? Um, can we center black, indigenous, and people of color art in disability arts? That's something I've struggled with in my work over the last 15 years. Um, but also, how do we, how, how are there these amazing, beautiful moments where things just break through? So, so much that I've seen in queer and trans of color performance in the last five years which has centered access and disability and disability justice has made me so excited about possibilities. So there's all these, there's some things that we just kind of seem stuck and then sometimes everything moves. Um, I feel the same way about watching um, indigenous arts um, flourish over the last decade. I've learned so much from visual artists and now performing artists. Um, so it's such a rich site and I think Part of what happens is when we just decide that we're speaking directly to our communities, then we're able to take the space that the theater has when we're not on display for what, it, what some imagined normal settler audience, when we actually decide that we're showing the work to our own communities. I think that's part of the shift that happens. Rachel passes the mic, Cyrus takes it, and passes it to Leah. When I think of a, a kind of intersectional lens of working, I, I also kind of think of what's happening on currently sort of on the other side of the coin around um, this kind of a vacuum effect uh, that occurs when um, we only represent a portion or fragment of the individual on stage. And um, I feel like uh, kind of intersectional representation is really about real. Uh, it's kind of the, the it's a human representation, a conversation that's been happening uh, during this conference is this notion of tokenism. And I feel like to this notion of tokenism is, is kind of fostered by this kind of vacuum effect. Let's represent this one uh, fragment of the person. Um, and I, in terms of intersectional representation, I think it's more, we need to kind of move in a direction of uh, more authentic representation of human experience. Um, and it's, it's happening. It's definitely happening. I don't want to chastise Canadian theater. Uh, but I do think that there's way more space to occupy. Leah passes the mic to Justin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nistoni danugu misamaniskam. In Blackfoot, uh, who I am in, in my name is Longtime Buffalo Rock. My Canadian government name is Justin Many Fingers, and my sign name is Dreams With His Hair. I don't know why I got that name. 
Justin flicks his long bangs. And uh, I come from um, the Blackfoot Reserve in uh, southern Alberta, which is um, uh, south of Calgary, of, uh, of the traditional Buffalo territory of, um, of the prairies. And uh, I identify, and I am, and I breathe, and I live, um, Nitsa Tupi, Blackfoot. And uh, I am queer, I am two-spirited, I am uh, indigenous, I am a person sought out as with a disability. Um, so in that, it occupies a lot of space. And uh, I've had many questions while I've been here and looking at the intersections of dis arts, mad arts, uh, deaf arts, blind arts. Uh, and um, I'm, I am having um, a bit of a hard time separating that. Um, a lot of my work uh, stems in indigenous theater, but um, that's what I've been categorized as instead of an artist. So I'm a Blackfoot artist or a queer artist or a disabled artist or all of these things rather than being an artist first. And uh, that's what I believe my, my work does. And uh, um, it's, it's really interesting to, to see such almost discrimination to dis arts in Canada. When, we, when we're talking about Canadian arts or theater or performing arts or whatever that is, it's, we occupy a lot of space, more than Canadian th professional Canadian theater and whatever that may entail. And um, the work that uh, I've done with Brian Solomon, um, What's Left of Us, uh, that was before I identified with anything of dis disability. Um, I've been protected um, by, my, by my family of trying to grow up normal and have been separated from that uh, with good intentions. They, they didn't know as well and you know, there's no one else in, in my current living family uh, who has some disability. So I'm, uh, I just turned 30 years old, but I'm forever 21. Um, <laughs> And uh, I feel like I feel like I lost out on such an enormous loving community with this mad disabled arts, um, and I feel like I've it's my whole life thirty years that I've really never identified, and it's been kind of put on me, uh, which is totally fine um, because I don't I think it would have taken me longer to to connect to the community. Um, so when we're working with this uh, show, what's left of us, me and Brian, it was. Um, it was a need to discover something inside. And, you know, if, if um, uh, for the ones who are not able to, to see my hand, um, it's my, my left hand, and uh, I'm um, missing some of my fingers. I have my thumb. And, uh, but if, if I put it in my pocket, I'm normalized. I'm... I can fit into society. But once it comes out, then it's a whole different story. And it's that separation that uh, I've kind of had to deal with for a long time. Um, but uh, creating that work was just a need to, need to do it. And I couldn't do it alone. I knew I couldn't, which is why I reached out to Brian and was like, let's do this together. Let's figure out what this is and discover who we are and what, whatever that is. But it was still not you know, trying to make disabled art or, you know, categorize it as that, but that it was a piece of work and it was a piece of art. And uh, <laughs> we've been doing this for two years now and um, we have not gotten a single review. <laughs> and um, indigenous arts, oh, they'll go there. They're like, oh, it's another Indian show and they want to do this. And, you know, it's a typical th something. And it's like, what do you mean typical or... The, the usual. It's like, well, we've been only doing it for 40 years, maybe. And uh, 
but yeah, so it's interesting to come from indigenous theater and come and be uh, the show live in all three of those as queer, as uh, colored, as uh, cultrified, as um, um, not abled show. And it's, uh, it's so strange that we have not got a single review anywhere. And, uh, and why is that? Why, why are people afraid to approach our work like they would at Can Stage or NAC or Soul Pepper? Like why, why, why won't they review? Not that we need that validation, but it's that in inclusion meant, you know, it's looking at a piece of work as a piece of art that speaks to something. Um, I think I've talked a little too much and took a bit of space, but uh, that's all I have to say for now. And uh, Iksugapi, thank you so much. He passes the mic to Cyrus. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you. I mean, yeah, myself as an artist, I would definitely say like, on the one hand, there's this rea a very real issue where there's just a lack of critical engagement with disability, deaf and mad arts. Like that's something that is like, there's, a, there's a, an absence of that. Um, and part of what we see is we, we, we recognize that again and again, contemporary works of art, contemporary performance, work that is part of uh, you know, the contemporary milieu is moved and understood to be community arts because it is about disability, deaf or matter. It's not that community arts isn't also an essential part of the fabric, right? But that we are, our work is being taken out of the context that we're presenting it in and, and put in a different context because of you know, an ableist, sanist, oddist, ocular-centric understanding of what is contemporary, like, uh, you know, um, rigorous theater or performance. Um, so I just wanted to just really echo that. And then also, you know, from my experience, um, my performance, a lot of my performance is about uh, the intersections of blackness and madness. And it absolutely ends up being about um, uh, activism because, you know, so much of my organizing and my art practice is informed by the things that are happening in current events. And every time I wake up and I open my Facebook or anything, there's another black person with psychiatric disabilities who's been killed by the police. There was someone killed in Montreal yesterday, um, a, a black man with psychiatric disabilities. And, you know, so then in my work feels personally very urgent um, and it's impossible to separate out uh, the, the, the conversation around blackness and the conversation around madness that I'm trying to have. Um, and I, and I, yeah, I think that we're often asked to kind of separate out. And I think what you were saying, Leah, about the sort of tokenistic approach, too, that we, we are expected to bring one piece of ourselves, you know, to sort of tick off a box often. Um, Smiling, Cyrus passes the mic right, then left to Justin. Um, I just wanted to add it on that. Oh, there goes my glasses. Glasses fall in two pieces. They're taped. Oh, by the way, these are these are government glasses that uh, we still get by Indian Affairs. He holds them up. And they're a piece of crap because they keep breaking and not even tape can ha handle. Um, but we, we still get these, a part of the treaty, which is bullcrap. Anyways, um, <sighs> and um, it's, uh, you know... <laughs> I guess it's a success, but what's left of us checks off so many of the boxes. And uh, it's, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to think of it, but it checks off you know, the indigenous, it checks off the disabled, it checks off the queer, it checks off the dance, it checks off the mobility. And so I think that's a pretty good thing, but it's like, you have to fit in those, or the people have to fit for, for those for our work and it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally, and my, this is Cyrus speaking, my work is the same. They're like, oh, and you're trans, oh my God. And they just start, start to cry in the corner because they're so excited that they're gonna get all the grants now. And they take lots and lots of photos so that then it seems like <laughs> they had a, a really diverse thing when it was really, I was the only, per, only person of color, only trans person, only disabled person performing, right? And yeah. So what uh, sort of, in terms of thinking about sort of the, the ways that we respond to this, I mean, this is the reality. How do we respond? How do we react? How do we intervene? 
It's Rachel speaking. Cyrus, I was thinking while you were talking about, and, and also Justin, about critics ignoring the work. Um, part of it is, I think, recognizing and criticizing what arts and theater is supposed to do in a settler colony. Yes, I'm saying that. Um, so disability is supposed to just come in and represent a trope or a metaphor. And it can't be too complicated. It can't be also the, the other stereotypes and metaphors and tropes that, you know, can, can also be trans. Um, so if we leave theater, I mean, theater is being transformed. It has, it's not that powerful. Mainstream is not that powerful, as powerful as it wants to be. Um, so we do transform it. But there's also some really, there's a lot of uh, ways that it gets reproduced the way it is. And so we have to criticize it and ask people to stop it. So, um, you know, stop bringing in a character with a disability to represent innocence or to represent, I mean, it's it just, just because it's no longer representing evil, maybe, doesn't mean it's not stereotypical and a metaphor. Um, and who's it for? Because you're thinking that the mainstream audience is not disabled. How do you know that? You're thinking that the mainstream audience is, is white settlers. How do you know that? Like, who, so there's so much work that goes into making it the same, even though we keep breaking out of that mold and making other work. Um, and a lot of that also happens in our um, studio training. So it's not accessible to a lot of us. Um, if you want to study dance, it's going to be Eurocentric. It's going to be gender binary. It's going to be um, harmful to your body often. It's, and it's going to make certain expectations. And it actually doesn't have to be that way because we've been doing it a, another way for 20 years that, that I know of. Um, so I think we have to start calling out what we see instead of just kind of trying to get our inclusion, we need to do some changing of what, what the mainstream is and what it's doing. Leah speaks. I appreciate everything you just said. And um, I'm, I think, and, and in a way I feel sort of apologetic with what I'm about to say, because I feel like so much of the responsibility falls at the feet of disabled artists, um, but I'm really interested in this notion of intentionality and being kind of very in, intentional about what we, about representing uh, diverse identities and that multiple identities can exist in the same person. Um, that's one. And other, and another idea that I'm interested in is this, like what do we, what is aesthetic? Like what do we call um, a beautiful piece of art? And I think, um, kind of conventional Western uh, art has kind of told us what beautiful art is. And I think revisiting what aesthetic is and broadly revisiting, and I think we've been talking about disruption this week uh, in, in our circle. Um, and I think sometimes disruption is really about being intentional about that critique and, and understanding that sometimes um, there's going to be a little fuckery going on on stage. And I think that's necessary. Um, and the other piece, and I'm maybe you guys can help me articulate this, is this notion of fear to speak. I think that even happens at times within um, kind of the disarts community itself, like when to speak, how to speak, and how to speak about something that you don't understand or don't know in order to uh, develop how informed we are. Um, so I guess I'm talking in a number of different circles here, but I, I do feel like part of it is about intentionally engaging with how we um, explore aesthetic and how we explore what performance should be. Um, yeah, and 
and that, I'm trying to do that with the dialysis project, like medical procedure as performance, needling, the, the sight of blood, which I understand is very disrupting. Um, but how do we also care for people who are experiencing it? Uh, this is uh, Justin speaking. Um, one of the questions that has really um, has challenged me in this process of the, the past uh, week and a half um, is understanding categories and how, how, I f <laughs> how I fit. Not that I want to, but it's, it's, it's a system that is how, we, how Canada operates with, with arts. And um, my, my thing with Indigenous arts is that because I, I already am Indigenous, I, I, I don't make Indigenous art specifically for that. I don't do the feathers, I don't do the beads, I don't do um, the Wild Buffalo Bill shows. Um, I make art. And uh, so it's Indigenous art without being Indigenous arts. So now my question is, well, if, I, if I'm kind of being forced to abstract some of my work with and put it into the disability, I'm using quotations, arts, um, then is all of my work a part of, is, is disabled art? Something that is like very specific, like the, what me and Brian presented, or um, a show called Ochkadox that focuses on the Baker massacre of, 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 my, of my people that a whole colony was wiped out. So is, is, that, a, is that considered disabled art? Because I'm all of those. And Canada is making me so confused of having, to categorize me in so much, so many ways. It's like, geez, give me a break. I just want to do art. Like, but I, and that is, that is my question. And I'm, I'm not close to any um, internal acceptance of, of that. And I'm, I'm just curious to have that discussion within this or um, over, over lunch or next week or whatever. But uh, thank you. That's the end of my current thought. This is Cyrus speaking. Yeah, that's such an interesting question, right? Like with my um, performance work, a lot of my performance is about my experiences of, of, of psychiatric intervention. Um, so maybe it's, it's pretty explicitly about m the way that I experience psychosis and the world. And, but I also am a visual artist and I do very large scale drawings and I do painting and portraits that are around the sustainability of black activists who are putting their lives on the line, fighting mostly for black disabled people. But that work is never really considered to be disability arts. But the process for me making it, I do it in a really long period of time. I usually do it like a performance in the gallery. I draw it live in the gallery over 84 hours. And that's like, um, totally about my experience of psychosis because I don't sleep and then I just go, 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 like it's actually replicating a process, but that is not understood as such because the curators and the gallery attendees don't understand disability or madness, so they wouldn't think of it that way. They'd be like, oh, you're so dedicated, you're really drawing a lot, you know, and that the portraits of the people that I'm drawing, I'm drawing them because um, I've experienced so much um, of the ways that the kind of direct action that we do can be very disabling um, because it, it really, uh, you know, it, it creates experiences of post-traumatic stress disorder and it creates, you know, anxiety and it creates a lot of things in the people that I'm drawing. Um, but because it's not explicitly in the, la the label, then they're also not taken up as disabled subjects, even if that is their experience. So yeah, like where do you, <laughs> but I, and I think that that sort of turns to that question about who it is who's programming our work and how they understand. And that sort of goes back to what you both were saying. And like, you know, when we talk about disability arts, we often, um, I think we, we necessarily focus on the experience of us as artists, but I'm very interested in disabled curators and disabled editors and disabled art critics and, disa you know, mad, disabled, crips, sick and chronically ill, you know, art critics and, 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 and directors and producers, because if we were in 
there are many people who are really interested in those fields, but they've been really shut out. And if they were at those tables, some of the decisions that get made on the very first time you have a conversation about a show would be very different for the rest of us because there'd be somebody who maybe understood a bit more about what we were making. That's my current thought. Thanks, Cyrus. It's Rachel speaking. Um, I love that vision. <laughs> it's making me think about, um, so for the last five years at least, I've um, had a, we have a, a working group. I started a working group called the Transnational Narratives of Disability. And we started that as a way for black, indigenous, and people of color um, who are thinking about kind of like, or not, disability. Um, part of the thing is that because there's a particular kind of public face of disability movements and disability arts, lots of people don't think that they're part of it um, because it might, the, the movement might be about accessing rights that lots of folks don't have access to anyway. There's lots of communities who don't think about being part of it. Um, so what we found was as soon as we started having our closed discussions, the biggest issues, and, and these would be so, people would totally pick up on this in arts and be interested in talking about it and critiquing it and dealing with it, but uh, war, uh, violence of racism, colonialism, and how that impacts us and what that ends up looking like. And so we, discussions about things, you know, so my, my identity then becomes more apparent, you know, it's like as, as a, I, I'm become visible as mixed race, I become visible as having chronic illness, I become visible um, as, as, and maybe most of the group is, as having, um, as experiencing madness connected to these, these experiences. And it's so hard to even unpack, like, I remember having a bit of a meltdown a few years ago about, I, I to a certain extent internalized since childhood this idea that I'm I, which I, I now think is a very Western or Eurocentric idea that I'm I'm individually different. I'm individually different, and and then that's okay, and I, you know I can do whatever I want with that, become proud or become you know or struggle with it or whatever. But it's individual and it's somehow essential. Um, and then more recently, um, as I've been dealing with. Um, chronic illness, realizing that some of the stuff that is connected to what I, and I, I don't even, I don't like to separate mind and body, it, it, but it's, it keeps being separated for us. But realizing, oh, maybe this actually has to do with like health stuff that I could change. So I was very proud, proud of madness as being something essential, right? Or, um, that really messed me up. And, and it actually became impossible to continue to think of myself as an individual experiencing this. And so we're thinking about it transnationally. Um, so thinking about it from the perspective of indigenous black folks and people of color it means I can think about it as a collective thing that, that happens to us and, and it's necessary to do that. So when I, when I was making dance theater, I had a company that looked like it was mixed ability, but it wasn't actually everybody in the group had relationship to disability. Um, and so we kind of maybe like Justin was talking about, like we weren't taken up because we didn't fit in disability arts because the work was about war. Um, like, well, you know, what, does, what could war possibly have to do with disability? Um, and, you know, mainstream audiences were like, that's great, but why doesn't why doesn't the choreographer hire trained dancers? Because one of the dancers who didn't use a wheelchair didn't appear. Like so, but I still look at that work. I still look, it's on my website. <laughs> it's it's up there. But I find it to be so beautiful. Like I I hired those dancers because they're so beautiful to look at. Like that's what motivates me to, as a kind of a choreographer and director, is like just the beauty and how people move. Yeah. And, and how they express, and, and this, you know, there's something unique about being an artist, which is different than saying, I wanna have a diversity on my stage. I think there's, 
it kind of sounds so similar, but there's an ocean between the two. Um, because if, you're, if you take away this idea of intersectionality and you're just thinking about like how do dancers get hired into like the big deal companies, there's a certain je ne sais quoi, there's a certain beauty about movement and that the same applies for all of us. Um, okay. and that's the end of my current thought. Then Justin's. This is Leah speaking. Apologies for dropping protocol. Just to briefly say, I feel like that experience, the show that you're talking about, is really a nice example of this, of like revisiting of of what we call beautiful. And I, somewhere along the line, someone else decided what beauty was, and what uh, I mean, art and theater exists to um, help us come together. It exists to, to like foster knowledge and understanding, learn about history, just pointing at you because of making Treaty 7. Um, and, um, and I don't know, it just feels like we do need to engage very intentionally with that space that you were just describing around what is beautiful. That's my end of my current thought. Uh, Justin speaking here. Uh, if, if, if people who don't identify with mad, blind, disabled arts, uh, deaf arts, um, all, all of those, um, if, if they consider it community theater or not professional, why don't we get to the root of that? Why don't these institutions, these who are training artists in Canada, why don't they accept us? Justin rests his index finger on his chin. Because there's no available resources to accommodate as a, an, an artist who needs a specific thing. You accommodate for an artist who, um, you know, it's... Uh, you accommodate for an artist who, who can't read, who wants to be an actor. You figure out ways for them so easily. It's no different from any, any, any other of us, you know, and something that, that happened uh, to me was um, uh, at the time I was going to Center for Indigenous Theater and uh, I, I wanted to do more dance classes and I was, I, I, you know, I really wanted to be um, a school of Toronto dance theater person of, of that and kind of get more training for that. And, uh, but because of my hand and uh, Martha Graham's technique is so asymmetrical and I'm not asymmetrical, I figured out how to look asymmetrical on stage. But I've had to adapt that. And I was so grateful for one of the instructors there who, because um, it, it gets so uncomfortable when public people make it an issue and like stop the whole class and try to figure out how we can accommodate. And then you become the freak show and it's like, mind your own business, <laughs> deal with whatever you need to adapt with as well. But, um, so we were, you know, having class and, uh, uh, one of the instructors uh, just casually walked by and uh, just dropped a phone book right by me and continued on and, you know, instructing the class. And But that had come from my brother's sister, Brian Solomon, um, because he, he has uh, the same um, amniotic banding when he's, he's uh, missing a little bit more than, than me. And so to, to figure out how to um, not strain the rest of the body that it wasn't it wasn't about making it asymmetrical it was about so that because their bodies have to overwork to accommodate um in the world that is not accommodating for us so it's a lot of strain on the body and you know we you know create issues it's uh it it, it hurts sometimes so brian uh figured that out with the instructors so that when i came along it was, it was adaptable for me. So why can't you take these ideas and implement them into these, you know, classical institutions or something? It's, you know, we, we can do it. Like, don't, you know, 
We've, we've had to, whatever age we are and whatever century we are in, we've always had to adapt to the world that is not adaptable for us. So something that we love and something we can, we can adapt for it. We've been doing it our entire lives. So please consider that uh, for the people who are our allies and uh, question that as well. And that is the end of my current thought. This is uh, Cyrus speaking. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that I think we've been kind of dancing around, or, pardon the pun, but um, the, this idea that, that we already have the tools and resources, stuff has been written down, we have the collective knowledge and shared lived experience of how to do all of this well, it's just not being taken up. I mean, it's not, you know, you really, there are, there's very little excuse at this point for not having, you know, an accessible um, production at this point, right? But it always is like, I'm just not really sure how it, no. There's people have been writing about it for at least 10 to 15 years. You know, Michelle de Cotonese did a presentation on the first day of the study about 45 years of, of productions that, that could be considered disability deaf or mad arts. Like the, the work has been done, the writing has been done. We all have been very generous in sharing uh, what we've learned and how we've repurposed and reimagined. It's just not being taken up. And that's the part that feels really frustrating for me because you know it's this continued ex expectation that we do the labor of trying to suggest or solve or adapt or change again and again and again. And every time that there's another production, it's like, well, we're starting from scratch again as if we haven't taken it up. And I think that that's you know, something that has been really, I think, challenging for a lot of us. And you know, um, yeah, did you say change the model? Yeah, the model is flawed, like the whole way of, um, yeah, there's just a, the, the interest in collecting and, re and retaining ways of working and adapting and changing them as they need to, needs to be taken up. And I think, you know, for me, like even just something like what I mentioned very briefly in the beginning, my entire day, my mood and my entire day is going to be impacted by the fact that there was a, a another black man with psychiatric disabilities killed in Montreal yesterday. That's my day now, you know, and that will impact how I'm able to be present and perform and engage. And there are ways around it. We have break rooms. We, we're modeling a lot of the ways here. These are things that can be taken up in any environment to make sure that no matter what's happening with our days, that we're able to participate fully. We have all sorts of ways. Um, it's just, you know, it's just not being taken up. It's Rachel speaking again. Um, and I'm thinking about how we need to bring this into our, our uh, training programs. Um, part of it is we have to actually hire ourselves to teach. So I'm hearing, you know, I heard Kazumi Soroka's comment a second ago. We have elders in our community who have been doing this for a long time. One thing that I've seen happen over and over again is that when we get, when we do get collected together, um, all of a sudden someone who doesn't identify as disabled comes in as the trainer. Then that happens and it happens and it keeps happening. Um, and it doesn't need to happen because we, we have the knowledge. Um, but it's, it's part of that process of being shut out of the programs in the first place, never being respected and having our careers kind of exalted the way other careers might be, never being invited to come and teach um, actual studio programs um, because we have so much. And many of us have kind of broken into the mainstream studio programs and like learned it and like come out with it or set up programs outside, community-based ones that are actually very rigorous. Like we've, there's so many things that have happened. Um, and we have to start pulling that together. Um, I, I think about how I used to go, this is like in the late 90s, early 2000s, I would go into classes that I could access because I pass as able-bodied. 
Um, and I would then turn around and I'd have, we'd have a workshop space rented down the street and I would reteach it. But then we would reteach it to each other in ways that actually that kind of teaching where you're honoring actual bodies in the room is just good teaching for everybody. So, yeah, I, I now teach for a living at a university and nobody who doesn't identify with disabilities ever come to me and told me that I'm a crappy teacher. Like actually, it's kind of the opposite. People think I'm an amazing teacher. It's because of this experience of adapting. But I have to say, like, there, you know, the, the way things are set up in training programs and educational institutions now, this is not a shock in any way, but it's violent. Um, if we're just talking about arts training, there's a violence to that as well. Um, so I mean, in my own case, when I'd go to classes, um, I remember being, I have a lot of trouble with kind of memory and kind of finding, spatially orienting myself, which is really crappy if you're a dancer. You're supposed to be able to pick things up like that, like right away. Um, so I had one teacher who started to pick on me. Um, and I can manage if I'm feeling comfortable, if I'm feeling included, but she started to, to do that thing, which is part of, sometimes it's like, it's part of the mainstream dance training, like to be violent and abusive. Um, I remember just before we were going on stage, in the institution that was just mentioned by Justin earlier, but I won't restate the name now. But we were about to go on stage to, to show the, it was an inten a summer intensive, and uh, she came up to me and she's like, I don't know how you're gonna manage out there today. Okay. I was like, really? Yeah, and I was like, you know what? We'll see, we'll see what happens. Like maybe I will run off the stage and end my career tonight. <laughs> maybe I'll get through it, but <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to keep doing my thing. Actually, I, I did manage it. But the, the level of abuse that, and, and the more I couldn't get it and couldn't do it, like the whole class would stop and stare at me. Like, um, and there was actually another student in that cohort with the same name. And I remember at the end of that class, then they all wrote a card to this really nasty teacher um, who still circulates and teaches all the time in the professional dance world. And this other student named Rachel was like, oh, I'm, I'm this Rachel, not the other Rachel. <laughs> so there was this whole like, it was like, oh my God. And I was older at the time. I was already um, late 20s and intentionally doing this to share it with a disability or, or it's community, my company. Um, and I was thinking like, I can't, like I'm choosing to do this because I need the knowledge to bring back, but like, what the fuck? <laughs> Uh, this is Cyrus speaking. Yeah, the, Lee was just saying the amount of work. Yeah, I, I've, I've never, I, because I also have a memory impairment, I've never had a performance where I haven't thought while I was waiting in the wings, I could just turn and run. I could just leave right now. A Cyrus-shaped hole in the door, nobody would know. I can't remember anything. But that's the moment where you, where in other contexts, they would be like, you've got this. Yeah. But in that environment, it's perfectly okay to be like, you're probably not going to be able to do this, which is so, you know. So, we have a, just a couple of minutes to, to wrap up, and I just wanted to, to just throw onto the, f the floor this idea that, you know, for people who are listening or people who are sort of engaging with our conversation, that I think some of what we've heard and some of what we're talking about here is that we need more critical engagement with our work. We need uh, a, 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 a radical reshifting of who's making the decisions and sort of in the power roles within theater in terms of programmers, critics, directors, dramaturgs, to have disabled, deaf, and mad artists in those roles. And I think what I've heard a lot of is that we, we, we cannot be asked to separate out parts of our identity. So that when we're thinking and imagining this new beautiful community of dis, dis, disability arts, um, deaf and mad arts, you know, this beautiful new community of hopefully disability, deaf, and mad practitioners and directors and writers, that we're making sure that we're attending to the beautiful other diversities that we have, all of our positionality, so that we're hiring um, indigenous deaf directors, we're hiring, you know, black, um, you know, mad dancers, that we're, we're bringing in an intersectional approach, um, because one of the things that we also have seen within disability arts is that there's been quite a whitewashing um, of the, the, the actual history. And so I think what I've heard people talk about today was just the real need to, to shift that up because that does impact our understanding of aesthetics, of time, of ways of working, of, of categorizations. Um, I wanna say thank you so much to all of you for 
joining me in this conversation, and I look forward to more discussions throughout the day. Thank you. Projection, floor-to-ceiling illustration of a multicolored tree. The artists return to their seats. Two mics and two music stands are in the middle of the performance area, one set significantly lower than the other. Projected text, excerpt from Rumi's 2001 by Paul David Power. Paul, playing David, is a four foot eight white man with brown hair. He is clean shaven and uses crutches and leg braces. Yusuf, playing Nick, is a six foot tall man of Middle Eastern descent. He is 20-something with curly, thick shoulder-length hair, a short beard, black-framed glasses, and is a below-the-knee amputee. David. I don't believe you. Nick. What is your problem? I did you a favor. <laughs> a favor? You, humili you uh, humiliated me. I, I did not humiliate you. You were the envy of every guy there with that blonde hanging all over you. Nick, you paid her to come on to me. So? You liked her, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, before I found out she was a, some kind of paid escort. She was not a paid escort. She was a friend of mine who owed me a favor. A friend of yours. Let me guess, a former a female conquest? Well, let's just say that we know each other very well. Claudette and I go way back. Great. Not only does the girl have to be paid to be with me, uh, she just happens to be one of your many leftovers. Look, you should be thanking me. Not all guys would do what I did. You got that right. You want to see gratitude? David holds up a paper. Hey, you put that down right now. Ah, oh, your favorite poster. Out the window. He throws it. You know, I always knew that you were a bit unbalanced, but if that's the game that you want to play, let's see how you do without your precious notes. Nick grabs some notes, drops, then kicks them. You stupid greaseball. Why? Those were your notes. <laughs> well, I needed to rewrite them anyway. <laughs> no, no. This does not mean I forgive you. I just thought you could use a little morale booster. I didn't think you would mind Claudette pawing all over you. But it wasn't a morale booster. You know, you made me feel as though nobody could be interested in me unless there was money involved. You weren't supposed to find that part out. It's just that you're always so down about yourself. I thought it would help if you were having a good time. Uh, you know, you better be careful. You're sounding as if you liked me. Let's just say you're growing on me, kind of like mildew. I wanted to show you that someone can like you, even if you don't like yourself. I like myself. Really? Because that's not what I see. You don't accept any invitations to go out. You're in this room every night. I, I practically had to force you to go to this party. It's like you'd rather be alone with a book than out there in the real world. It's not easy being out there. You don't know what it's like. You know, I walk down a hall, and people stare at me like I'm some uh, sideshow at a carnival. Uh, oh, they try to be polite as they uh, shift their eyes away or, or whisper, but I'm not blind or deaf. I, I hear them whispering, oh, look at that, or what happened to him? You, you can walk around this campus with your ass slick back hair and leather jacket with the greatest of ease. You know you look good. Me, I, I walk around feeling like I'm some alien from another world. I'm not normal. You are normal. No, I'm not. Hey, even you were shocked when I first moved in here. That was just me being... Stupid. Do you know? Do you know how great you are? Ugh. If you say I have a nice personality, I am jumping out that window with the poster. <laughs> you do have a nice personality. I know you don't like it, but people are going to stare when you walk into a room. It's normal. But I swear, people get past it when they see the real you and not some stupid crutches. You know, this is really funny. Uh, because it wasn't too long ago, you would have done anything to get me out of this room. And now you're singing in my praises. Despite you being a really annoying roommate, I don't like to see anyone crap on themselves. You can hide out in this room all day, or you can go out there and live your life. I try. I, I really do. But then I see the guys on the football field running. I, I see kids jumping in the playground. And then I see me. I, I, I keep asking myself, why me? You know what I wish, more than anything? I wish I didn't have it. I wish it would just go away. You know, it's not fair. Life isn't fair and the world is a screwed up place, but we have to play the hand we've been dealt. Now, how you play that hand, 
That is where you were in control. <laughs> Who would have ever thought you would be the first person I talked to openly about all this? You know, you put off a, a pretty tough exterior, but underneath that, uh, all that hair grease <laughs> is really a... Don't say it. A nice guy. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> Just um, don't tell anyone, to tell anyone, okay? Uh, I have a reputation to maintain. Okay. They bow. Eliza, Alex, Debbie, and Adam sit in the conversation circle. Eliza is a white, cisgendered, femme-presenting woman in her mid-30s. She's 5'6", thin, and has noticeable CP, and almost always has her right arm tucked between her crossed legs. Her brown hair is short, with longish bands. Alex is a 5'6 woman, slender, in her late 40s, with short blonde hair. She wears sunglasses and has a small black receiver in her lap and an earpiece in her ear. Debbie is a white woman of average build, early 50s, blue eyes, shaggy brown hair. She is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and wears a leg brace. Her bedazzled crutches lay on the floor beside her. Adam is a white cis male, 33 years old and 6 feet tall with a muscular build and short brown hair. He has black tattoos on his left forearm and identifies as lowercase d deaf. Beside him is a music stand with an open laptop on it. Sarah hands the mic to Eliza, close up on Eliza in the conversation circle. Thank you all for joining us. My name's Eliza. It's Eliza speaking. Um, and we're going to engage in about a 45 minute discussion around the topic of precarity in theater. Um, let's just start with those two words. Um, thinking about what precariousness means to us in um, a settler state um, as disabled, mad, deaf, crip, spoony, chronically ill folk who are represented as precarious, who experience an ableist, racist, sanist, colonial culture in precarity, and also the precarity real or projected of arts and um, arts funding, and how we may feel as though there is a scarcity of resources to create art we may experience a scarcity of resources to create art. So there's lots of um, ways that precarity intersects with our bodies and the art that we make. Let's start there. I'm going to hand the mic to Debbie to my left. So if I'm at 6 o'clock, Debbie is at 9 o'clock. Thanks, Eliza. Um, so in preparation for this little discussion, I did a little research on precarity, and I just want to share some things that I discovered. Um, this was from the Journal of Cultural Anthropology. So it talks about precarity as an emerging abandonment that pushes us away from a livable life in a growing body of scholarship centered on social marginalization. The concept of precarity has come to name the politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks, becoming differently exposed to injury, violence, and death. Um, and so it talks about precarity in terms, of, um, in terms of lack of access to resources, primarily, um, and, and talks about precarity as a, as a condition of, of millennial capitalism, um, so that that sense of... Uh, radical individualism that seems to be pervading our society right now. And so as, as people with disabilities, we, I think we can embody the, the, the true nature of our identity, which is interdependent uh, rather than independent. And I think we can uh, model that for society at large uh, in a way that people who, who don't have the benefit of, of living with a disability can't. Um, and, and then when I think of precarity in terms of 
theater specifically, it's, um, it seems like a, a double whammy in a way. <laughs> um, the precarity of being a freelance theater artist, for example, is, is something we all live with, um, or something I certainly have lived with. Uh, and, the, and the precarity of theater as a, as a form, theater doesn't exist in, in a capitalist society, in, you know, in, in, in a strictly capitalist uh, model, theater can't exist. Or theater can't do its job, I think. Commercially viable theater, I don't think, does the job of what theater needs to do, which is to, which is to connect us um, in this sort of uh, global empathy project we call the human race. You know, that it it needs to, yeah, it needs to join us in and and build empathy in the world. And I don't think commercial theater does that. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that's the first job of theater. Uh, and that's my final thought. Debbie smiles. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, this is Adam speaking. Um, this idea of uh, precarity and precariousness has particular resonance for me coming from uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, I, I live in Saskatoon. And um, I'm not sure if many of you have been following the news of what's been going on in Saskatchewan mm -hmm. over the last uh, little while, last year, last year, last couple of years. But um, suffice it to say, uh, with regards to both disability and with regards to the arts, uh, theater in particular, um, Saskatchewan is, not to put too fine a point on it, but ass backwards in, <laughs> in its approach. Um, for example, just a couple of months ago, the Saskatchewan provincial government voted to get the funding and close down the Saskatchewan Transportation Company, which is uh, basically um, it's a provincially run bus service that transports people from rural communities to uh, across the province. And the primary users of the Saskatchewan Transportation Company, or STC, are people with disabilities. And they need that transportation service to go from uh, town to town, to go to their doctor's appointments, to visit their relatives. That is their primary way of getting around. And the provincial government took that away from them. That was one thing that they did. Another thing that they did was they canceled the, uh, 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 the hearing aid grant uh, for the province as well. And it's, it's really a familiar refrain that we see in Saskatchewan where if the government is in trouble, if they have overspent on the budget, then they go to two places first. One is they cancel programs that help people with disabilities or people uh, who have mental illnesses or people who are deaf. And two, they go after the arts. And I think that's a, that's a familiar, <coughs> excuse me, a familiar story, not just in Saskatchewan, but across Canada as well. Okay. So coming uh, from that perspective, um, in, in Saskatoon in particular, um, it's, it's quite difficult to uh, produce uh, deaf and disability theater. So uh, coming to an environment like this with so many wonderful, beautiful, talented people, is, is like night and day for me. It's like going from a desert directly to an oasis. And, it's, and what, I'm, what I'm hoping to uh, take out of this conversation and out of uh, my experience here is to take uh, all, all the knowledge, all the connections, and try and light a fire in people's asses in Saskatchewan. And I hope that uh, you all will help me do that. That is the, the end of my, my thought. Thank you. Hello, this is Alex speaking. Um, what a great question, Eliza, thank you. I will, I'm gonna answer the first half of the question about um, our experience of precariousness. Um, I'm gonna answer it by talking a little bit about the difference between my practice um, as a blind artist in Canada, 
versus my practice as a blind artist in the UK, because I think, I think the first thing that comes to mind is I feel far more precarious about my practice as an artist in Canada. Um, and that's not because um, the United Kingdom necessarily has loads and loads more arts funding, although I think that's probably true as well. It's because the United Kingdom has a cultural policy and a scheme that enables a working disabled person, woo, like many are in the room, um, to have funding to pay for whatever they need to have access to work, access to work. And art making is work. And what I think is also so essential about the success of this program is that the funding does not go to the company who wants to employ you. It does not go to the organization who has you part-time for six months and then stays at the organization when your contract is over. It goes to the, dis to the disabled person themselves. They take the money with them. They take the equipment with them. They take the support with them. And that is what we need so much in Canada. We need that in Canada. We need to be able, I, I feel so strongly about this. I, I, I know that I need to be able to go to see a play, to listen to a play, to experience art. And in order to do that, I, I often need to take an audio describer with me, because a lot of stuff here isn't, well, hardly anything in Canada is audio described, actually. Um, I sometimes will need to take a support worker with me in order to manage with the travel, um, or part, often these, these uh, uh, experiences, not experiences, but these events you know, involve networking. And that's very difficult to do when you have a communication uh, need. Um, I'm, I'm sure that my, um, my friends who are deaf would agree that, that, you know, they would need an ASL interpreter to participate um, uh, uh, at, at any kind of community gathering. So it, it, it's, I just, I, I, so, I, so, so the answer to your question, I'm far more precarious in Canada than I am in the United Kingdom, and I want that to change. I want to come home. I really want to come home. Um, the second half of your question was about theater, and um, just to pick up something that um, Debbie said about, um, you know, what is theater, what's the, what is theater for? Um, yeah, I, I, again, I sort of, I, I, I agree that I think that theater must be about uh, preventing us from simply living inside these, these individu an individual sense of life. You know, I want this, it's my right, I can have it. Um, I think theater, it, it, at, at its sort of one of its greatest potentials is to reinforce a sense of collective and a sense of community. And a, and a collective responsibility and collective opportunities. But yet again, if there aren't any ASL interpreters on the stage, if there isn't audio description, if there aren't uh, seating, designated seating for wheelchair users, if there aren't ramps into the building, then it's not doing its job. It just can't do its job. Thank you. This is Eliza speaking. I'm wanting to know if anyone in the circle wants to respond respond to anything at this point? Looking around the circle? Okay. So um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to layer this discussion with one more question. Um, I've been really trying to think about how to frame this question well. I'm not a theater person. I'm a theater goer. I'm not a theater maker. And I find the intersection of disability and theater to be a very precarious one. Um, we, as disabled people, 
and deaf people and my people share a history um, with our intersecting, which is an intersecting history, of course, with racialized people, indigenous people, um, indigenous deaf people, racialized disabled people, people who um, live in their body differently. And that history is one of being on display in, um, in freak shows, in medical theaters, on the streets. And, and that's something that we, um, when we enter onto a stage, I feel it right now, being surrounded by you all, loving people, that I am on display. I'm putting myself on display. And I have to say that I feel love in this room, but I also feel precarity in this room. So um, being on display, being watched, is something that I've experienced um, my whole life. I know, that, I know that others have for different reasons. I'm a white person. I'm a presenting cisgendered woman. So I've experienced safety in spaces that others have um, experienced precarity and violence. To, um, referencing specifically to what Cyrus was talking about earlier with how the news of a, a, a black man with a psychiatric disability being shot by police hit Cyrus in a different way than it might hit me. Um, back to my original thinking. So this, we are, we are in a, st we are in a circle surrounded by people and this is precarious. And I wonder how you all as theater artists, um, work with that precarity in a creative way, how you manage, how, you, how you've come to theater as an appropriate response to thinking through that precarity of being on display. And I do have another layer to that question, but I'll just leave it there. Um, well, maybe I'll just uh, invite anyone to think about also the precarity of representation and who we are representing when we are on that stage. And I'm on the stage a lot. I represent a white and disabled person a whole lot. And I feel... Um, I feel like I have to start questioning, questioning that and maybe um, thinking through about how those invitations come. So maybe that's the second part of my question, is to think about the politics of representing ourselves on stage, but also the, the precarity of representing ourselves on stage as bodies who are on display a whole lot. Um, that's the end of my thought, I'm handing it to Debbie. Thanks, Eliza. This is Debbie speaking. Um, it's, it's, I guess my experience of being on display is quite different um, from yours in that, in that I've acquired my disability throughout my life. So I spent the first part of my, my time as a, as a performer as, as an able-bodied performer or a perform, performer without a disability. And, uh, and so I, I feel like that sense of being on display is something that all performers feel on stage and that in fact, as a woman, I feel greater comfort with being on display in my body that is non-normative than I did in a body that was expected to be normal. Um, so I, I feel like I can, I can claim my, my uh, the, the, the truth of my physical presence with my disability more than I could. Um, I guess, and perhaps that's, that has more to do with, with the um, unrealistic expectations we have of women's bodies when they're on display uh, than it does with disability. But then again, that's another intersection of experience. Uh, in, in terms of representation and representing disability on stage, I'm, 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 
I, okay, uh, last summer I was in a production of Richard III playing Richard, and there were some, some times, because it was promenade and outdoor, there were times when I needed, um, I needed one of the running crew to be ready with a wheelchair to, to transport me to the next spot where I would enter because I couldn't get there fast enough on my own. There were other actors in the show who were not disabled who would have quick costume changes and there would be a member of the running crew who would be waiting backstage with their costume, helping them to change costumes so they could get on stage as quickly as they needed to. And it was the same, our needs were the same, right? We needed assistance getting from one scene into another the way we needed to. But in, in uh, interviews with media, they were asking what accommodations are being made for you as a disabled artist. And, and there weren't any, right? But there, there were just accommodations being made for me as an artist. Similarly, I, I went to see a, another production of the same play, Richard III, with an able-bodied actor playing the role. And, uh, and there was, he had special shoes made so that one sole was bigger than the other so that he could limp. And that was an accommodation made by the theater to accommodate his ability to make him appear to be disabled. And yet if that accommodation was made for a disabled actor, to play a role, to appear to be abled, that would be seen as some sort of heroic effort on the part of the theater, right? So, so there's just a disconnect there in terms of, of, of uh, the accommodations that are, are required of the organizations that engage us as disabled performers and, and the truth of representation. And that's my final thought for the moment. Smiling widely, she hands the mic on. This is Adam speaking. You can probably hear the synapses blowing up in my head. I <laughs> see, see them. Um, uh, I, I guess what I'd like to say is something that, that links this idea of um, representing uh, disability and deafness and mental illness on stage with what Alex was talking about in terms of the kind of infrastructure that you experienced in the UK, and how we don't we don't have that here in Canada. Um, uh, last year, uh, uh, my play Ultrasound uh, debuted on uh, the main stage of Theatre Pass Murat in Toronto, and um, uh, Ultrasound is uh, the story of uh, a married couple, uh, a deaf man, and a woman who's hard of hearing, and. The, and uh, the, the wife, Miranda, she wants to have a child. And Alphonse, her husband, wants to have a child too, but he wants that child to be deaf. He does not want a hearing child in, in his house because of uh, previous experience um, uh, uh, at the hands of hearing people. And uh, the play was even though the play only had two characters, it was an enormous undertaking because we had to uh, hire a small army of uh, interpreters, uh, one of whom was Karma. And, and we also uh, had um, uh, to bring in uh, deaf community consultants to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, you know, that the theater was prepared for uh, uh, for deaf audience members to make sure that uh, the actors uh, were comfortable and that uh, the rehearsals ran smoothly. And it was, the best way to describe the experience was in the words of uh, the Cahoots Theater uh, general manager. And uh, the show was co-produced by Cahoots Theater and Theater Pass Murat. And the Cahoots general manager, uh, her name is Kate Vandermeer, she said that the entire experience of producing this show was, quote unquote, a vertical learning experience, which means that every single aspect from uh, putting the script together, from uh, making sure that the interpreters were in place, every single aspect of the production was an, was an uphill climb. And the reason for that was because that infrastructure to put on a play like that in Canada does not exist. It does not exist in Canada. We have to build it literally from the ground up. 
And so uh, hearing Alex talk about her experience in the UK, if we can, if we can bring in that kind of uh, funding structure, uh, or if we can reevaluate this kind of structure that we have here in Canada, then that would be a, a significant victory. And uh, that is the end of my thought. Thank you. This is Alex speaking. Um, the question reminded me of, it took me back in time to um, smudge uh, my, a, a play I wrote based on um, my personal experience of uh, sight loss um, was produced in, I think it was 2000, um, the first time it was produced. And um, so 17 years ago. Um, and I, I remember, Eliza, that I, I actively, like I made a very easy decision that I was not going to play the part of the lead character losing their sight. Um, and the reason for that was because I remember feeling at the time, or worrying at the time, um, that the audience would, would only see it as my story and be worried about me the whole time I was on stage. <laughs> Um, which was probably very wise because I and I think you know and I think by not being on stage I think I managed I think the play did achieve um, going beyond you know this, a, a sad story about um, a nice girl from Puss Lynch kind of thing um, and it wasn't a sad poetic story and um, uh, by the way for people who don't know I'm from Puss Lynch that's why I just said that um, uh, so, so it reminds me of that decision of wanting to want, of wanting theater to to represent uh, more than just myself on stage. Um, now, fast forward into to 2017. I don't about that at all anymore. I I don't actually feel I don't worry about um, automatically. Um, representing a, a metaphor for something, you know, justice or um, ignorance or all the things that, you know, sometimes characters who can't see represent. I, I just don't worry about it. And, and yet I know that, that there are times when if I'm on stage and, and uh, there will be somebody in the audience thinking, oh, did that mean mm, that, you know, there, there was a justice metaphor going on there. I can't necessarily stop how audiences, n nor do I actually want to control. I don't actually want to control how audiences respond to me. What I want to control, I think, is whether or not I feel comfortable to accept that particular role, whether I feel comfortable to do that particular bit and own it comfortably and safely, then um, I don't worry about it. Um, and I guess the only other thing, the, the only other, um, examples of, of representation that I can think of was that might be interesting for the discussion was how, as a writer, um, I had the opportunity to write for six um, disabled actors for a television series in the UK called Cast Offs. And um, it was very interesting. We, some of the press was, you know, saying, oh my gosh, they're they're exploiting, you know, disability. They're, they're the writers are all they're doing is, you know, they're just putting those disa disabilities up on screen. And it's like, no, we weren't. We were, as writers, we were told who the actors would be before we wrote the scripts, which was great. I thought it was a great technique because I knew I was writing a storyline for a blind man. And let's face it. If I write a storyline that, like, the key moment in the script is when the man jumps in and steals the car and drives off, and, you know, that's not going to be the blind man. It's highly unlikely. So I think it's actually really, I think it's a really useful tool to think about representation and then write the story. Um, and that's my final thought. Eliza passes the mic across the circle. Thank you, Alex. Uh, um, um. We don't need to go in a circle if we don't feel like going in a circle. Uh, so, um, offering the mic to the circle, any, any um, 
thoughts about anything that was shared. I, yeah. This is Adam speaking. Apologies for breaking the chakra. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, just in case anybody's curious, I'm reading uh, the real-time captioning here that's, that's allowing me to follow the conversation because I'm, I'm deaf. Um, Adam refers to the open laptop on a stand beside him. He reads it briefly. Okay. Um, one question that I have uh, for uh, both uh, Debbie and Alex and, and Eliza is, um, and I, I think that this ties into Debbie's earlier point about capitalism and about uh, the mainstream and uh, the point that you were just making, Alex, about uh, this idea of representation and metaphors is, um, as, as disability theater artists, do we have an obligation to create theater pieces that challenge the audience to rise up to, uh, I guess, our, our way of thinking, where are we supposed to simply confirm? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, do, we as disability or, as, do we as disability theater artists have an obligation to, uh, to create theater pieces that, that challenge the audience and uh, ask the audience to, uh, to rise up to a certain level of thinking? Hi, this is Debbie talking. Um, I wouldn't say it's an obligation. I say it's an opportunity or a privilege. Um, uh, yeah, I would never do that out of a sense of responsibility. I do that out of a sense of, let me at him. You know? um, uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, in terms of, of representing our, our, ourselves and our disabilities on stage, I, I just feel like such a great opportunity as a performer, to have a disability, to be able to to use that in performance, um, I, I I sometimes and and it kind of references a precariousness as well. That that there's something about the precariousness of my body now as a performer that is so much more compelling on stage than than before I had a disability. I call it the Cirque du Soleil factor. You know, if I put down my crutches and walk across the room. Everyone is on the edge of their seat <laughs> because because it's dangerous. It just is dangerous, and and like like watching Cirque du Soleil, you know, when you're you're waiting for the person to fall, and and it just gives it's such a gift as a performer to bring that kind of presence and danger to the stage. I I I don't know. I just find it an opportunity rather than a, a an obligation or a burden or a or a, you know, a challenge that I have to face. It's, it's actually an exciting opportunity. Uh, that's my final thought. Smiling brightly, she passes the mic. Thanks, Eliza. This is Alex speaking. Um, yeah, I think I, I would um, echo what, um, I would repeat what uh, Debbie just said about it being um, an opportunity. Um, uh, I'm just sort of thinking through some examples of how I felt about different pieces of work. Uh, you know, I think it, I'll tell you where I feel responsible, not, not so much obligated. I always feel a responsibility to imagine beyond the assumed in terms of who will be my audience. I always try and imagine um, many differing ways that people will engage with my work. And that, I feel, is my responsibility and my opportunity. In terms of content, I think it totally depends on what the purpose of that particular piece of work is for. Um, if it's, if it's to blind children in theater who have never experienced theater before, then I'm going to be thinking a lot about them as audiences when I write the work. As opposed to if I'm writing a piece to respond to systemic barriers in the underground system of London after the 2012 Olympics took all the money away, 
um, then it's going to have a very different, my responsibility or my sense of responsibility to a piece like that would be to, to make sure that the content is probably as hard hitting and, and possibly not comfortable actually. So I think it's a, it's a great question and I would say that it just depends on the intention of the work. That's the end of my current thought. Thanks, Alex. Um, let me think. Um, precarity. Uh, thanks for bringing in capital. Th sorry, this is Eliza speaking. Thanks for bringing in um, capitalism, Debbie. You know, it's it's obviously um, very um, central to the to the discussion of um, precarity at this point. Um, I, I'm wondering about, um, what am I wondering about? Um, I'm wondering about uh, two things. Um, I think it is central to bringing capitalism when discussing about, when discussing making work, because making work requires money. It's labor, as you said, Alex, it's work. When we're, when we're working with other people, we need to pay those other people. We need to pay ourselves. Um, and I think that in Canada, in this north part of Turtle Island, we think about um, there being a li a limit, limited resources. And, and there are limited resources, especially when we're adding things like accessibility budgets to our grant applications, things like this. Only a selection of us get the money um, required to make our work. Um, so, wondering about something that I think Rachel raised in the last uh, discussion was um, is about how disability community is represented and who feels included, who feels um, um, who feels. Um, um, as though they can identify with how the disability community is, has been represented and who doesn't. And when we make theater, we meaning not me, you, when you make theater, um, there is a responsibility, I think, to, um, to think about how we are representing disability, deafness, madness in, in a way um, that perhaps is more invitational than we've seen already on stage. So th some of the things that we've seen on stage, it, it's really important to say that these are not historic ways of representing disability on stage. Um, what Alex was saying before about um, a blind person being a trope, um, which is a word Rachel used for, for justice, that's happening right now. There's a non-disabled theater um, producer, director, producer, um, director and writer who's written a script in Toronto which will be performed at some point in the near future where, where a, blind, um, a blind actor represents justice. So I think that, I mean, that's one thing that I think we should recognize as a living history. And it also speaks to, again, to amplify the need to include um, our community in every level of the making process. Alex, if you were writing a script, I bet that you wouldn't slot in a blind person to, to represent justice, as you said. Would you? Can I ask, would you? I know. No. Okay. No. The, the answer is no. So, so that's one thing that, that, I mean, yes, we need uh, dramaturgs and choreographers and front of house and um, directors and screenwriters and, you know, all of these things to be, to, to be of and from our community. But also wondering, and this is really a question that I, that I have too, is, um, the responsibility that we might have to open up representations of disability, um, being in our particular bodies and writing from a particular um, experience. Um, yeah, and maybe how we take up space in, 
in the, in the midst of um, a scarcity of resources? How do we... That's my question. It took me a while to get there. How do we take up space in the midst of perceived scarcity of resources in a responsible way, acknowledging that in theater we represent disability, madness, deafness? Alex is leaning in. <laughs> oh, the end of my talk. Thank you. Um, yes, I did lean in. This is Alex speaking. Um, I was at uh, uh, Jessica Watkin, who is in the room. Um, uh, I know you're out there. Um, uh, invited me to something that she was involved with. And um, I know that I said something at that conference that, that I think I'd like to repeat just to start to answer your question, which was, we have to take risks, be clever, and don't get caught. Um, <laughs> And I, and I think so because, you know, all my talk about access to work, which I honestly believe, is we've got to make that the future of Canada. At the moment, it's not the present. We do have scarcity of resources here. So I think we, I think we have to be very clever. And I, think, and I also think we have to, to use the word interdependence again and again and again. We have to take care of each other and we have to, we have to make the work. We have, to, we have to find a way to make the work. But I think it's. I think. I, I think we we have to, to be. In, uh, I would say that taking care of each other and taking care of each other's needs, until we find a way to be a little bit more, I suppose, in ownership of having those needs met, um, I think is how we we keep moving forward. So I guess the word interdependence and don't get caught, and that is the end of my um, current thought. This is Adam speaking. Um, Adam looks at his laptop. By the way, I'd like to thank the real-time captionist for doing such an excellent job. It's, uh... <laughs> okay. Um, to respond to your question, Eliza, it's, it, seems that, it seems to me that your question really gets at the heart of exactly what we're doing here at the Republic of Inclusion, which is, how do we make things less precarious? How do we make things more permanent? And how do we address the scarcity of resources? And how do we make sure that we get more, of, more uh, deaf and disabled and mad artists on stage across Canada? Because for me, what, what I imagine happening at uh, the end of this gathering is that all of us are going to fan out across the country. And then we're going to be like beacons from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and. But what that's going to do is that's going to create um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure what word to use. It's, 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 it's going to create a wave. It's going to, it's going to literally, it's, it's going to light a fire to kind of keep the Lord of the Rings thing going. And it's um, and armed with that knowledge, we can and armed with the experiences that we have here, we can then take uh, take everything that we've learned and begin the really valuable work of making things less precarious, less scarce. And I begin to uh, promote uh, these dynamic and exciting stories that uh, everybody here and more artists across the country are creating. And part of the challenge uh, from a storytelling perspective <coughs> is... Um, that in Canada, it seems that we have two governing narratives when it comes to disability. And uh, the first one is uh, what may be called the Terry Fox narrative. You know, this idea of, uh, of overcoming obstacles, overcoming adversity. This is, this is something that we see in the newspaper and in the news all the time. So that's, that's one narrative. And then on the, on the other side, we have the Tracy Latimer narrative. And if we are telling a story that does not fit into either one of those two narratives, then people in Canada don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to respond. And I think that that's why uh, 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 why disability and mad and deaf theater is so precarious, because it's only allowed, uh, Leia used that term tokenism earlier. That's why 
that we are only allowed token appearances, like run, run play every five years or so, and then move on. And then uh, we're not allowed, and uh, we're not allowed a sustained amount of time in the spotlight, which is exactly what we need to do. And that, that's that, that's something that I believe will will uh, be one of the uh, results of after this gathering. And that is the end of my current thought. Hi, this is Debbie speaking. I just want to pick up on that a little bit. I feel like as uh, the, both those representations of disability are objectifying of, of us as people with disabilities. And I think, and in a way, when people look at us, we, we, we remind them of their own vulnerabilities. And so objectifying disability is a way of separating themselves from their own vulnerabilities. And so it's, I think, our gift to the world as performers with disabilities is that we remind people that they too are vulnerable, that, that we all share a vulnerability and that we're all actually interdependent. And this, this myth of independence, this myth of the, the Marlboro man, you know, the, the I did it myself is, is bullshit. And I think, I think our gift to the world is to, is to remind all people that we actually are interdependent. And the way we make theater is interdependent. We can't start working until everyone's in the room. We all need each other. You can't make it alone. Um, so the precariousness of our, of our bodies, our brains, in, in, in this state of, of disability is, is mirrored in, in the art form that we practice and is, and is uh, a model for the way society could, could be. That's my final thought. It's Eliza speaking. Thanks so much to all the presenters. Um, I'm getting the signal that we are almost out of time, but I, I want to just close by saying a little bit. Um, so Adam, I really like your, um, your description of how we may be moving from a place of precarity into a place of permanence. And, and that's the move that we're making here today. Um, and so I would ask us all to think about um, what we are creating when we were, are making that move. So I think you're right, Adam. Some tropic understandings of disability are the pitiful the pitiful, unlivable life and the heroic super crip. And we know that those representations don't um, match our lived experiences, but we also know that lots of disabled people aren't working against those tropic risk representations. Again, what Cyrus was saying, lots of people in our community are working against the misrepresentation that their body is out of control and needs to be shot or incarcerated. So I think that, um, that when we're moving to, into this place of permanency, how can we not just um, replace a bad story with a good story? How can we open up many, 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 many stories um, of what we might consider to be um, valuable within our community. Um, and how can we do that interdependently? How can we do that um, in solidarity um, with other movements? And again, just to end, um, a question that I have for myself is, how do I take up space responsibly in making sure that um, when I am invited into these conversations, um, as I'm lucky enough to be invited, and I'm 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 really appreciative. How can I um, how can I think about um, using using this opportunity um, in in a responsible way? We're also here as part of um, Canadian scene, and lots of different um, festivals going on um, right now, and so to. To also say that um, I think we need to be, um, as we're doing, um, to take these opportunities to actually, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't get around to the discussion, but thanks, Alex, for bringing up the access to work and for, um, for all of you for bringing up some concrete, tangible examples um, that we want presenters to hear 
about how they can support us in moving from a place of precarity to a, a place of permanence. And thanks again, Adam, for that language. Um, I guess that's may, perhaps our, our final thought, unless somebody else wanted the final thought in the circle. Final thoughts? Final thoughts. Okay, thank you everyone so much. Eliza turns off the mic. Smiling and nodding, she looks at Alex, Adam, and Debbie. At the performance area, Nick plays at his music console. The projection screen is a flood of purple and pink. Chris is about to go to the center of the performance area. Chris is a deaf man of average height and build. He is white with short brown hair. Chris's signs are slow and smooth, his brow predominantly furrowed. Sonnet 29 by William Shakespeare When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my boot cries and look upon myself and curse my fate wishing me like to one more rich in hope featured like him, like him with friends possessed. Desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, happily I think on thee and then my state. Like, like to the lark at break of day arising. From sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Chris nods, his eyebrows furrowed and eyes wide. He signs faster. Hey, everyone. Nick, my friend, told me a joke the other day. Do you want to hear it? He points at us. Yeah, okay. There's three guys. An Italian. A Cuban. And... A deaf Canadian man. He winks. So they're all on a train. And the waiter walks over to the Italian. And asks him, what would you like for dinner? Is it all pasta? So the waiter brings over a huge plate of pasta. And the Italian wafts air towards his nose, swifts it, takes a bite, and then opens the window and th throws the pasta out. Squinted eyes looking towards the indicated window. So, waiter's like, why did you do that? Waves hand. Because where I'm from, there's plenty of pasta. So the waiter asks the Cuban, Chris rubs his chin. What would you like? And I'd like, he said, well, I'd like a good cigar. So the waiter brings over a box of cigars. Bites his cheek. The Cuban sniffs the cigar. Lights it. Indicates smoke from cigar. And then opens the window, takes the box of cigars, and throws it out. Indicates tumbling motion through air. And everyone's like, why did you do that? Waves his hand with pursed lips. Because where I'm from, there are plenty of cigars. So then, the deaf, so then the waiter asks the deaf Canadian, what would you like? And the Canadian starts pointing to the menu and starts trying, describing what he'd like. 
and the waiter doesn't understand. So the deaf Canadian opens up the window, takes the waiter, and throws him out. And he's re- goes flying at the window. Indicates tumbling motion through air. And they both turn to him and say, why did you do that? He's like, well, where I'm from, we have plenty of hearing people. Puts his hands on his hips. He opens his mouth widely and points at us. He raises his hands, the sign for accolades. He leaves the performance area. Sarah and Cyrus walk to the center of the performance area. An interpreter stands at right and hands Sarah a mic. Hi everyone, this is Sarah speaking. Um, Thank you so much to everybody for uh, this uh, wonderful morning. And just before I forget, um, behind us, the incredible work of uh, Sunny Bean and Jose Garcia has been uh, filling this uh, amazing screen and also the, uh, the live streaming work of, of Martin Jones and Marnie Richardson um, uh, and also two RASL interpreters who have been um, on the screens and to all of the uh, uh, people who are working to, to make today, uh, this morning possible. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're just about to head out uh, for lunch uh, and into the to the, uh, the light of day, whatever's going on outside there. So that um, uh, we're, we're back at two uh, two o'clock, um, and that is my current thought. This is Cyrus speaking. I want to say uh, thank you again to Baraka de Soleil for helping to rearrange the room out there. Um, the, there will be lunch out there and you can check in. Um, they're very happy to go over all of the things that are in the food to make sure that it's a food that's safe for you to eat. And if you could just be mindful to try to avoid cross-contamination. Um, that's my final thought. Bon appétit. <laughs>